Brought to you by Moonbeam Multimedia. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Doing okay. Thanksgiving break went by quickly. It did. Here we are, preparing for the next holiday. Yes, which I'm ready for as well. We hope you enjoyed our uh, our last episode. That was a pretty special reflection from you. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed it, but I couldn't get through editing it without crying <laughs> a little bit. So that was a problem for me. Yeah. But um, I had yeah. a few uh, friends text me and be like, well, one, they're like, why am I crying? But also they were like, we could hear your voice crack. And I was like, gosh. Yeah, that's what did it for me, too. I could hear your voice crack in that one part. And I was like, Hoo-hoo. it was fun. It was it was kind of uh, therapeutic to write. Yeah, it was kind of a good it was a good feeling just to get to write it. Mm-hmm. Reading it was really hard. It was so much harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's a weird thing for even just to do a different format is mm-hmm. a little bit weird. Uh, yeah, because I was day. sitting. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was sitting there and it occurred to me that you weren't going to talk. Yeah. And it's very weird to just sit when for three years all we've done is talk to each other Mm -hmm. to then just do it by myself. It felt so strange. Yeah. I was like, wow, this is horribly boring. You (laughs) had a big spotlight shining just on you. I hated it. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Well, I will be doing a short reflection for our next episode. That's again, because just a little housekeeping. We usually don't do uh, episodes during the Thanksgiving and Christmas weeks. Mm -hmm. We take time off, but this year we're doing something a little different and just offering those little reflections, which have been really fun to work on. So thanks for sticking with us through those. So yeah, upcoming, like I said, this week is our last kind of normal episode of this year. And then we'll have another short one and then it'll be 2023. It will be. And we'll have been doing this for three years officially. For some reason, yeah. Yeah, so thanks for sticking around with us on 16 to 1. We've loved hearing from all of you and just doing this project. It's been a lot of fun and uh, we're going to continue with it. What are we talking about this week? You want to get... Want to get into it? Yeah, let's just do it. Okay. You actually chose this topic. Well, I did. I was inspired because we were driving everywhere for the, uh-huh. the Thanksgiving holiday. You know, our families don't are not super, super close. So we have to drive to and fro and get Christmas trees and decorate and do all of those things mm-hmm. over the holidays. So there's a lot of driving involved. And I was like, there are a lot of bad drivers on the roads. And how did they ever get a license? It, yep. That's the question that I'm always asking. You also most recently hail from maybe the state with the worst drivers. Maryland? uh, Yeah. So I no longer live in Maryland, but I did for a long time. And Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, the Delmarva area is just full of the worst possible. Like Washington, D.C., just the worst drivers that exist. I I think D.C. probably has to hold the crown for worst, even over those three. Like, I don't think Baltimore is as bad as D.C., I think DC uh, it's a different is, kind of bad in yeah. Baltimore. DC, the density of traffic is so intense. That's the difficult part. Baltimore, you don't usually get that much density, but there are other dangers <laughs> driving in Baltimore. Which is there are Baltimore. potholes that will just like it, you, you'll just disappear into them. Bye, pop up, and you will just never see your car again because it's been swallowed by the earth. So that's driving in Baltimore. Yeah, I DC just, is a little different. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's different. But anyway, that's kind of got me thinking about driver's ed, which has been on our list of topics to look into for a while, because I've always kind of wondered why are the drivers so noticeably bad in Maryland compared to here in Ohio, where there's still plenty of bad driving. Don't get me wrong. But but Mm -hmm. I don't I don't feel this this seething rage deep within my my soul when i drive in ohio well the midwestern polite applies even yes to driving yes it does usually you usually like wave and let somebody go in front of you that would be uh, unheard of now you're mad at them yeah but you'll do it yeah yeah you're like Uh okay begrudgingly i will let you go ahead (laughs) yeah but in maryland the definition of midwestern polite (laughs) yeah but in delmarva driving there's no even like looking around to see whether there are any other drivers around you no you just, they don't care. You just merge and hope they get out of your way. Like, I actually, when I first moved to Maryland, I was kind of confused about merge laws because I, I called my mom. I was like, don't you have to yield when you're entering the highway? 
you can't just expect everyone to get out of your way, right? Like there's there are yield signs there almost always. Not I was in like, nobody here <laughs> is yielding when they're emerging. Why? And she was just like, I don't I don't know why that would be. That's a good question. Just one last thing about Maryland driving. Yes, please. Some of their on ramps are on the wrong side. And I hate that. <laughs> We have creative on-ramp positioning they, in Maryland. I think Maryland is just like, that'll do. And they don't, like, they, they're they not going to do the work to make it consistent. They're just going to be like, well, it fits, might be short, but you can do it. And then you just hit your gas so hard and hope. Yeah. Someone, There's no... Someone told me once, and this is anecdotal, so I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but it seems true that the, the turning radius... And like the, the, even probably the length of on and off ramps, but especially the turning radius on yes. ramps in Maryland is tighter. So much tighter than it, Ohio. You feel like you're going to roll your car, even if you're going five miles an hour, because the turn radius is so tight on on and off ramps. I have never experienced any loop ramps as tight in Ohio. Y- yeah. They also so don't So if that's use... not true, then it's just like a weird coincidence. But like, yeah. I've never experienced one that's that tight. They also, at the time, or at least when I first moved there, someone told me also that they do not use reflective paint on their roads. So, you know, any, any line on the road, Uh that paint here, at least in Ohio, is usually reflective so that you can see their like flecks of shiny stuff in it. So you can see headlights bouncing off of it or what taillights or whatever, and you can see it much more easily in bad weather conditions. So rain, snow, anything. No. In Maryland... It's not reflective, so people just drive in rain by turning on their flashers and hoping for the best. <laughs> I almost, I think that my trauma response has tried to make me forget about what Marylanders, 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 yeah. Marylanders, and the Annapolites. Um, <laughs> Annapolitans? The Annapolitans, which I've called the Annapolites just to be It sounds you. more Greek when you say it that way. Right? It sounds like ice cream. Um, it, it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I remember the first time I was driving in Maryland with like a pretty significant rain and everyone went like 20 and turned on their flashers. Yeah. And I was like, this is illegal. Hello, everyone. This is illegal. Oh, we everyone not just be... turns on their flashers in rain. It, it doesn't the matter. Slightest, the slightest little drizzle. A sprinkle. Yeah. Is enough. And now when we're in Ohio and like I, I consider Ohioans to be like sort of hardy when it comes to like driving. I mean, some of us are very bad at driving in the winter, but I feel like for the most part, we're a pretty hardy bunch mm-hmm. just given like the snow that we get. And there's always one in a torrential downpour that has their flashers on when nobody else does and when you don't really need to. And you get up and it's a Delmarva car. It's like, well, you're one of those. Yep. And the rest of us Ohioans are just like, stay in your lane. (laughs) Get out of my way. (laughs) Woo. (laughs) Anyways. So where's this come from? How did we, how did some of us against all odds get a driver's license? That's a very good question. Let's dive in. As it just so happens. Driver's Ed was born out of a terrible traffic encounter that happened on Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah. So my. Because that's the most traveled holiday. My inspiration was also the inspiration. (laughs) The bad drivers at Thanksgiving, also the inspiration for driver's education, as it turns out. I'm going to take us way, way back. Okay. It's just what I do. Way, way Um, back. Yeah. Back to the invention of internal combustion engines, to be precise. Um, I just read an essay about this. Really? I had a student write about, yeah. Well, maybe you should read no, 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 no. I didn't say I understood it. I okay. just said, I did read about it. It was interesting. I'm going to briefly gloss it. No, I, we, we really I, don't need to know everything about internal combustion in this episode. Maybe later, but not, not in oh, this episode. Oh, no. I'm not ready for the next one yet either. Okay. Okay, okay. tell me. So it's 1886. Uh-huh. Carl Benz. That, that is a name that you might recognize. Like that Benz? That Benz. Okay. Developed a gasoline-powered automobile. And made several copies of it in production. And then, of course, a little bit later, the Ford Model T came along. That was in 1908. Became the first automobile to be mass produced on a moving assembly line. And that's like one of the only things I remember learning in school about American industrialization at this time. (laughs) It was just like... The Model T. I can see the picture in the textbook Mm -hmm. of the Model T, Mm -hmm. like in my memory. I can too. The 1910s onward are when we start to see cars become common on American roads. 
again, we're always kind of focusing on the U.S. here, but this is also industrialization that is happening elsewhere in the world. That singular worldview? Yeah. yeah. It's very I mean, American well, of us. I just, no, <laughs> it's not because I don't care about other things. It's just because we, you know, we try to keep our podcast within some time mm-hmm. limit and we just want to talk more about what we know about more directly rather than trying to find our way through how all the other countries in the world handle this. But we should probably be better about expanding our perspectives. So, you know, just a little plug. If you've got ideas for 16 to 1 that are region or country specific or, you know, don't feel like they might fit in with the rest of what we do, just go ahead and write into us because we'd be happy to learn yeah. about it. It's just that we we're less confident in those areas. So anyway, we are driver education. Again, like I was just saying, um, the UK was actually the, the country that sort of started leading the way and turning driver education into a business so I think in like 1909, 1910, there's this institution called the British School of Motoring. Sounds very fancy, like everything British it does. Uh, it was founded in 1910 in South London. It offered hands-on training and courses in driving skills. So like managing controls of these cars and road aptitude and how to repair your vehicle and uh. everything like that. It kind of feels like a AAA crash course in one. Yeah. And they also, of course, offered vehicles to drivers who wanted to practice because vehicles not being quite as ubiquitous as they are now... It's a little hard to get your hands on them. Kind of hard to imagine. So, and then 1920 is when school districts in the U.S. start providing instruction for traffic safety. So this is important because traffic and driving education started out as something that we thought everybody should know how to do. We housed it firmly in the realm of public education, and that is very much no longer the case. Schools do not, by and large, now operate driver's education courses yeah i when i first got my job a couple of the teachers that i just worked with a year or two were people that had once taught driver's ed Mm -hmm. at the high school i worked at like wow so and that was within the 30 ish 35 ish years prior you know what i mean like so it's not that far removed that that used to be part of no it's absolutely not i mean this is all fairly recent history in the grand scheme of things like i said 1920 and when we start to see it in school districts in the u.s so at first Driver's ed was kind of integrated into other subjects taught in secondary and high schools. I mean, this is kind of, there are a lot of things that that got specialized and abstracted from American curricula, and this is just one of those many things. So, I mean, this is the same deal with shop and like what used to be called home ec and things mm-hmm. like that. Those Those things have been, and business, those things have been abstracted into elective offerings a lot of times and other programs and yeah. yes or like technical training programs or like you know a lot of different things yeah. but they what used to kind of be part of a holistic education got started to get pulled out over time and that mm-hmm. is we'll see that's what happens to driver's ed okay so we go from this integrated into other subjects approach to then we get a public school district in minnesota uh, gilbert minnesota offering a separate course in driver training in 1927 so again cars really haven't been been on the roads all that long at this point and then amos nyhart he's a penn state faculty member he's lived in state college for a long time he is basically the father of driver education programs as we now know them in the u.s so in 1933 he started teaching students at state college high school to drive and then he later taught the first course instructing others how to teach driver education it's said that he got this idea to teach driver education while visiting his mother in Milton on Thanksgiving Day in 1931. A drunk driver apparently hit his parked car. Oh, no. (laughs) And he, uh, in addition to being annoyed, he was like, hmm, I bet the frequency of traffic accidents is probably due to the fact that we're not actually teaching anybody how to operate the vehicles that they're driving. Maybe we should do something about that. So he's like, okay, let me come up with a driver training approach that's going to reduce traffic accidents and improve highway safety. So he paid his own expenses, used his own car, which was a apparently a 1929 Graham Page sedan. I've never even heard of that. I haven't either. Company. I'd so love to see that. I, I need. I, I am not very well versed in Can I look vehicles. This up real quick? Sure. I will describe it to you. Oh, I'd love to know what it looks like. It's probably ugly as sin. Click, click, click. Oh, it's fun. Oh, that's fun. No, this isn't ugly at all. Okay, this is actually a cool-looking car. These are... It looks like every old car you've ever seen. 
It looks like an Oakland. Anyway. Yeah, it kind of does. Okay. Those are pretty. I'll include a link in the show notes. Yeah, it so turns out everyone... it's a, a somewhat attractive vehicle. That was cool. Too bad it got wrecked by a drunk driver. Oh. So never mind. <laughs> he pays his own. No, maybe it was a different car at that point. But, uh, 1929. He's got this sedan. He's uh, he outfits it with a rudimentary dual control system, which I would have loved to see. So I'm assuming he's got two steering wheels and two sets of, uh, you know. So he just flexed it. He just cut out the. I don't know what that looked like. His feet, his brakes. <laughs> I would love to know. I would love to know what it looked like. How fast that car go? <laughs> Yeah, the top speeds of these cars at this time, not... 12 not, uh, miles away. <laughs> I think it was more than that. But was it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they go fast enough, like, well, okay, that that rather famous scene, sorry for the spoilers. I was actually just going to talk about Downton Abbey, yeah, if you're gonna, it's like 10 years so, old. So, like, Downton Abbey is, like, not that far off from this That's time period. He, he goes fast enough he to kill whipping. himself, so, you know, it's he was gone. So yeah, they, right. they move. They're right. dangerous. All right, all right. They're dangerous enough that Nyhart's like, we should train people not to be so dangerous. We should know how to drive this thing. So anyway, he outfits his car with this dual control system. During the second year of this uh, attempt at driver training, he was about to stop the program because there was a lack of financial support. Um, But then the State College Rotary Club provided funds (laughs) for it to continue. I love that. I would love to have been at that meeting. Yeah. So we fast forward to 1934. He's at Penn State. He earns a master's degree in psychology and education. His thesis was titled, The Relation of the Training and Other Characteristics of Automobile Drivers to Their Proneness to Accidents. Which feels very cut and dry. I I mean, that's a very, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would have been super interested to read that master's thesis, but I'm, I'm sure he did a fine job. Uh, Sounds a little dry. So in it, he analyzed replies to a questionnaire regarding accidents, discussed the methods used in teaching 41 people to drive. Kind of cool. He showed that the type of teaching had a close relationship to safe driving, which... Okay. Yeah. Seems obvious enough. Well, we're still dealing with it now because now the type of teaching we do in driver's ed is shown to be not quite so effective, but we'll get there. Oh. So in the same year, 1934, Nyhart wrote The Safe Operation of an Automobile. This is the first textbook on driver education. Oh. Uh, he developed this curriculum. It called for 45 hours of classroom wow. instruction, 24 hours of in-car observation, and eight hours of behind-the-wheel instruction. That's In-car observation. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, okay, so you watch this somebody is kind else of drive. More, yeah. This is more intense than current driver yeah. training curricula. That's why I was doing the math. Yeah. Um, I thought in-car observation might be you driving, but that's even separate. Yeah, you watch somebody else drive for an entire day of hours. It's a long time. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So anyway, in 1936, he joins the staff of the American Automobile Association in Washington, D.C. That's AAA. We are AAA members, thanks to my (gasps) grandma, who makes sure that we have AAA memberships every year at Christmas. And it's a really great way to feel safe. So I did not know that's what it stood for. Uh, I've never seen that typed out. Oh, you just thought it was just called AAA? That was no, I mean, I, I assumed it was something. I just, what, what would I go? <laughs> Why? I've not, not been that bored. It's not something most people usually have to think about, to be fair. So he joins the staff, focuses on safety issues, returns to Penn State two years later, and he establishes the university's Institute of Public Safety. He estimated he taught more than 800 college professors and 20,000 high school oh teachers gosh. how to teach people how to drive. He also uh, had courses on driving with dis- disabilities and the effects of alcohol and drugs and driving. And then he did a bunch of other kind of interesting stuff. He served on the president's committee on traffic safety under Truman, Kennedy, and Johnson. He received Pennsylvania's meritorious medal. It's high- highest civilian <laughs> award. So anyway, he does a lot. He's very involved and he's very recognized for his contributions. And uh, we probably would not have had to suffer through our hideously boring driver's training programs had it not been for this guy. And that's not to say that driver's training has to be hideously boring. It's just that, in my case, it was. And we'll talk about that a little more, kind of where driver's training programs are now, because this is not a favorite activity, especially for for younger kids, who are the majority of people going through driver's training programs. They're, They're young. And a lot of driver's training programs now focus on reducing risks to young people because automobile accidents are the leading cause of death of young people yeah okay so what is what i'm gonna hand it over to you now to talk a little bit about what driver's ed looks like these days when we're not driving our uh our what was this grand page sedans anymore well um unfortunately <laughs> the reason why this came to mind 
uh-huh. probably directly correlates with the fact that there's no national standard for driver's ed courses. Yes, there is not. So Ask Maryland. This might um, come as a surprise, but that's why it just, depending on where you are, it certainly does get better and worse. Yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind. If you feel like there are differences in driving culture in different places in the world and it's in the U.S., there yeah, there, there <laughs> are differences and they are significant sometimes. So, So one of the problems... Is that in 16 states, drivers who complete education courses can sidestep some graduated licensing restrictions, including the age limit, to receive a learner's permit. Yeah. So the requirements for hours behind the wheel or passenger and night driving limitations, you can you can get around these things. I definitely had uh, peers in school whose parents somehow got certain waivers for them not to have to do parts of their driver right. training courses for whatever reason. I don't remember what the reasons are now, but they definitely were like... Oh, yeah, my mom signed this thing, and now I don't have to do, like, 20 hours of driving. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. That doesn't feel right. (laughs) I don't trust you or your mom. So Stay away from me on the roads. Yeah. I always feel that way, too, when I read about what that process is like for someone driving a motorcycle. Oof, yeah. Because you're solo and younger, and it just seems, yeah, anyways. Yeah. Okay, so 16 of 50 states have that option. Mm-hmm. Which isn't great. So mm-hmm. probably three of them are Delaware, Maryland, Virginia. Um, <laughs> probably. So. <laughs> so the other thing is that the public... Sorry, Maryland. I love you, but your drivers are terrible. Oh, I do love you. I just yeah. hate your drivers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another big problem is that the public programming doesn't exist anymore in the way that it did. And it's mostly been replaced by private companies that offer the instruction. Yeah. So during the 1970s, 95% of students in the country had access to public driver's ed. And to date... Today, only 10 states have dedicated public programs. Yeah. And Ohio is not one of them. No. So It, it, it was big. It was, like, really big at this point in time. It was almost ubiquitous in public schools, yeah. this driver education Yeah, like stuff. I said, I worked with people who taught it. Part of the problem of this, by the way, is that when you shift from offering this kind of instruction in public schools to private companies managing it, is that now it's, like... You get driver's education when you can afford to pay for it. Yeah, it's a privilege. But a lot of people have to drive, even poor people. (laughs) And it's just yet another hurdle that perhaps we shouldn't be asking people to have to go through when this is a public good for Mm -hmm. the public safety of Mm -hmm. everyone. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. It's okay. Please continue. No, it's a good soapbox. So... There are 23 states that require driver education for all drivers under 18. That that seems remarkably low to me. Yeah. 23. 23 require them for under 18s. Okay, great. Like, And then an additional six states require short pre-licensing courses, which are on drug and alcohol awareness, and that's for anyone under 18 mm-hmm. who's going to drive. So currently in 35 states, a teen can attain an unrestricted license before 18, whether or not they take driver's ed. And in 25 states, a teen who takes driver's ed can get an unrestricted license at a younger age. Yeah. Which is also why in states like North Dakota, you can get your temp license, I think it's like 14 and a half or 15. Yeah. So currently, the majority of driver ed programs are required by their states to include at least 30 hours of classroom instruction. Some states, that number is as low as eight hours. And in some states, that is as high as 56 hours. Uh Uh-huh. So you remember Nyhart's recommendation was what forty five? Yeah, eight feels like not enough. Eight feels like woefully eight feels not like, enough. Uh, they they said they did it and they signed the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> some data to maybe support that. Um, the twenty twelve National Highway Traffic Safety Administration report stated that approximately eight percent of all licensed drivers involved in fatal crashes were between fifteen and eighteen years of age. Yep. Um, as a whole, driver's ed has been criticized because it does not seem to reduce young driver crashes, or at um, least not as much as it should. That's yeah. For certain. I mean, to their credit, though, it's it's really hard to say that like it doesn't work when it varies so greatly. Mm-hmm. Like I think like this umbrella, st- or like I guess I should say. This blanket statement isn't super fair. What we really need is a no child left behind of driver <laughs> education. We need common core state standards for driving. Okay. Drivers will be able to. And then we will evaluate <laughs> driver educators. Uh, but it's just on like. On these standards. It's like just not fair. 
Just because there have been states where it's been arguably more successful. I hate to use that because it's like an air quote kind of more successful. But like, obviously, the goal is fewer crashes and especially fatalities at, at an age yeah, range like no, that. Yeah, no, you're right, though. I was, I forget, I think it was Washington State. There's, It was either Washington or Oregon. It was one of those Pacific Northwest states out there. They have a really intensive driver training program. And it's been shown to at least marginally improve some of these numbers that they're talking about. Yeah. So it was evidence for how beefing up some of these requirements actually does help to at least some degree. Well, and we didn't really mention this, but one of the most interesting things about when I learned about your experience as a Maryland driver, how long did your license last? Oh, yeah. Every eight or ten years we renewed. Yeah. Or at least that was it at the time that I got. That might have changed since then. But But Ohio, it's every four. Yeah. So you consider that in Ohio, they're getting their hands on these people every four years to at least check their eyesight briefly. Whereas in Maryland, it's like, "Eh, well, you might be 800 years old. Yeah, although I do think Ohio just changed that so you no longer actually have to go in to renew your license. You have to go in every so often of a cycle. Yeah. I think you can go at eight years now. I see. Without, But still, maybe... I'll have to eat all my words and Ohio will become much, much worse generally as, as drivers You're gonna be because of this change. Uh-huh. But when I learned that about Maryland, I was like, how? How can you just go years and never check in to be like, I can still do this. Look, that has to be a reason. Change my mind. I mean, I will admit that I liked that because I didn't have yeah, to go to the awful. BMV or DMV, whatever it's called in your state, which is like the 27th circle of hell as far as i'm concerned like oh, it's more than motor just vehicle that. administration like offices I, I will not complain about it's that a place at great length but built, they make me really irritated it's a place just built to make you sad it's built to make me specifically sad because i get extremely impatient i don't like dealing with bureaucracy being being around people i don't know makes me uncomfortable it's yeah. just like and then they're always just the crankiest i'm just saying like I just, i've never had a good experience at a, at a at a motor vehicle administration. No. Uh, anywhere. I don't think anyone does. <laughs> I don't think it exists. It's just like, It would probably be better if I could just do it online, which I now can. Oh, and I'll have to try it out and I'll report back because yeah, I think yeah. this year I finally can do it. Okay. That has to be a reason though, right? It might contribute. So the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has supported training efforts for drivers in a number of ways. They supported a study of driver training techniques over a period of five years in DeKalb County, Georgia, and they found that elaborate training programs were no more effective than more basic instruction and crash reduction, <laughs> yeah. which feels so backwards because you would hope that more is more, but it's not. It's really not. I mean, that's kind of actually something that you said in your, uh, your, your love letter to teaching last week is that more and more and more of education or providing some version of education is not always the answer. You need to give your best rather than just yeah. your most. I think driver's ed could probably learn from that important lesson. You're probably right. So in 2006, the American Driver and Traffic Safety Education Association put forth new recommendations on what should be taught and how long the uh, discussion of each topic should be, like surrounding driving. Mm-hmm. So their original recommendation uh, in 2002 was that classroom driver's ed should last 30 hours and then the behind the wheel was at least six hours. Um, since 2006, it calls for 45 hours of in class and then eight hours of behind the wheel. And then it's not really known to what extent driver's ed and the different states follow any of those topics or recommendations, but it's basically like, this would be good. And then the yeah. states are like, yeah, but what if? That's and really then- interesting. So the newest recommendations, and this was from a couple of years ago at this point, but they, so they're calling for the same number of hours that Nyhart called for in his yeah. program, 45 hours of in class. And I think, what do you say, eight hours of behind the wheel training. But he actually also recommended that additional 24, 24 hours, hours of observation that is completely missing from Just this. watching you drive. Yeah, I wonder what we're missing, you know, I wonder what we're all missing out on and not having that kind of rich curriculum. But I'm also wondering what in the heck I would have done if I had to sit for that many hours of driver's instruction, because I can attest that it was truly the most boring and unengaging Mm -hmm. educational experience Mm -hmm. of my life. Mm -hmm. The only thing I remember about driver's ed is that I walked into a room, some lady turned off the lights and played some really horrible traffic safety video and everybody basically fell asleep and there was paperwork that we had to do. Yeah, that's and what quizzes. it felt like. But it was the least engaging. It, it was just possibly the wor- like a tour de force of the worst instructional practices and 
it, it's just it's not it's not good it wasn't good when we took it no. anyway maybe, maybe it's, it's improved maybe it's improved since then but i highly doubt it hasn't it. i teach these people it hasn't yeah well talk, talk a little bit about what this is like for your kids yeah so well one thing i wanted to mention just as i kind of talk about my kids right now what they what they uh, do to complete their testing and actually getting a valid driver's license where they can drive independently. I had to go to six classes. They were each four hours long. And there was a little local place in the town where we live. They only had so many seats. Yeah. And it was only on Tuesdays and Thursdays from yeah. 5 to 9 p.m. Yeah. And if you missed that week, you would wait for three weeks for the class to come back around. Yep. That's pretty much what mine was okay. like. So huge, long chunks of time, like which is proven to be bad yeah. for in terms of like attention. Yeah, like a fifteen year old is not great for four hours straight after a whole day of school. You're not even good for like forty minutes, no. more than forty minutes straight. It's so, just like again the worst possible educational practices. But anyway, yes. So my students today do most of it online. Uh, the How classes do, you do that. Why so do you online, all of those stuff? hours of class that we sat in, uh -huh. they do it online. I mean, well, that okay. So that you know what makes happens? sense to me because there's really no benefit. It's basically just like doing it online if the instruction is no, that bad. No, they just bad. watch some recorded slideshow. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's basically all it was before. So why not outsource that to online? Mostly going to be that bad. Mostly all they do is they hit play, and then they go do something else, and then they come back, and then they answer a question. And we wonder why our yeah. drivers are getting worse. So that's how it, most of it works for my kids. I can't say all of them certainly go like that, but that's at least for the, the classes, right? So currently in Ohio at 15 and a half, you can get your permit, which is, you take a test for your permit, don't you? Yeah, there's a written test. Okay, there's a written permit. test. So they go in person for their permit. They take that. They have that until they turn 16. And then during that time, I remember for me, like my parents had to sign some paper and said that I'd done so many hours of what kind of driving. Yeah, I it was, don't really it's hear... like supervised by your parents. Yeah, but if you have guardian. a permit, I think the only people you can drive with are your uh, parental yeah. guardians. Whatever. Yeah, there are restrictions on who you can have in the car when you have a learner's permit. And then you take your actual driver's license test. And that's also in person. So the course, driver's ed, is usually what they take online. And then the permit and the license, actually, are a test done in person. Did you have to parallel park in your driver's test? I did. Me too. I only... It's not a thing that everybody had to do in their driver's test. And I didn't learn that until later either. Yeah, we had to do that thing where they put the four cones like yes. in a corner and then they put the one up top and then you yes. drive up and go And back. you get points off if you yeah. do anything. You I remember. look funny or... I remember a pretty colossal argument between my dad and I when he was trying to teach me how to do it. And I kind of thought for a moment that maybe I didn't need a license. You still don't like parallel parking all that much. I don't have to do it that often. I had to do it so much. You are so good at it. I had lots of practice. You are so good at it. I had to practice parking I, between all those bad Maryland drivers. I know. I rarely have to. And so when I do, I literally get out and trade spots with you. Oh, I like it because it's like a math problem. I'm just like, okay, how explains, far up do I have to go? That and then I so get bad the angles it. right. Yeah, it's just like okay. math in my head. Sometimes I surprise myself, though. <laughs> I have gotten into a few spots that even you were like, no, and I did it. No, you... you now, could we get out? You've no, You've risen to the challenge. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> You're not wrong. Um, I should ask my kids if they still have to do that part. I don't... I actually don't know what it looks like today, I guess. I assume they still have to learn those things. They should. I but would I do hope. know... You really can't get by in any kind of city if you can't parallel park. No. So. I do hope... I do know at one point they couldn't use backup cameras. Yeah, I think that's still a and thing. they had to cover them. Yeah, so that you could do it in the event you didn't have one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, most of my students are doing the courses online. They're doing it during their study hall or whatever. They like let the little thing run. There are yeah, tons of yeah. practice tests online that they take a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's no benefit to doing the kind of driver's ed instruction that we have now. There's no benefit to doing it in yeah, person because again, it's just just somebody reading stuff to you that yeah. you could read on your own or playing videos or whatever now they still have to schedule rides with like an actual yeah um observation obs time. yeah like with an actual i shouldn't say accredited because i guess none of them are but an actual you know i think they actually are i think you have to be certified to teach it okay somehow so they still have At to do in that Ohio. yeah i think it's eight hours that they have to do observed driver school time like with an driving, instructor, with an eight instructor hours of driving with an with instructor. You. Yeah, yeah. Also, that's awful. Uh, sitting for eight hours in a car with somebody you don't really know 
who is just yeah. there to judge you. I think I did two four hour <laughs> for a nervous trips. a nervous small child like me. That was like the the yeah. bane of my existence. Yeah. I hated doing that. <laughs> I felt like pretty confident though because my parents really really did a lot to get me driving places. Like, yeah, it wasn't about the driving for me. It was, it was about the, the social aspect of yeah. having to sit with a stranger in a for car. Four hours. About which I'm already a little bit nervous because I'm not a very, you know, I'm not a very experienced driver. Sure. So it is a little nerve wracking. Yeah. I'm not like bad at driving, but no. I'm nervous because there's some stranger staring at me. Yeah, so no, just I just like, mean, I've had some of my students not even drive on the interstate until they do that drive. Okay, when and I that took it, feels... we had to actually log how many hours were on interstate and how many hours were not on the interstate. I don't remember that. I remember having to do daytime and nighttime. Mm, yeah, I don't I think remember we interstate, that. but I also remember like... Maybe that was just something my parents made up, but we definitely were like, okay, we're going on the interstate now specifically because no. the interstate is scary. Oh, I'm not disagreeing with you. I remember being my parents being very intentional about making sure I did that, mm -hmm. but I've had students who've never driven on the interstate who only do it the first time that they're with <laughs> an instructor. That's horrifying. That poor instructor. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I see them in the parking lot ready to pick up a kid and I want to tell them no. <laughs> like, not that one. Don't do it. Put on your helmet. Don't get in there. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. I do, you know, as I've said a million times, I love I love teenagers, but I teach sophomores, so mm -hmm. I get this. So I love... You're right in the middle of it. I am, because they're, they're usually turning 16 when I have them. And birthdays are very stressful for 16-year-olds, because everyone's looking at you expecting you to get your thing. And if you don't get the thing and everybody figures it out because you don't drive the next day, it's, you know, it's big if news. You don't pass your test. Yeah. Oh, I've had kids take off like two days after their birthday because you can like, I think you can like retake it like two times in a row and then you have to take a break and then you have to redo, you know, parts of the course. So, um, Interesting. What did you lose points on in your driver's test for your license? Um, I Did you have a perfect score? I have no idea. That's not a thing that's in my memory bank. Oh, I remember this so vividly. I think I might have had, like, I think that when I was doing one of the cone things, I remember being told that I was, like, going too slow. Like, I was oh. being too cautious. Okay. Because if you like, even knock those over, it's over. No, no, I didn't knock anything over. No, I'm just saying. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't it. like, well, that was the thing, actually, that I remember being irritated by is that I wasn't told beforehand that I like wasn't supposed to do whatever I wasn't supposed to do. So I got points off for being essentially too cautious. Okay. Going too slowly through some part, part of, of the parking part. But I don't remember exactly what. Uh-huh. But I still I still passed just fine. I got points off for driving too slow on a street. I don't that's bananas. I mean I, I suppose they're they're like minimum well, there are some safety concerns. No, no, there are, but like, I just, like, when you're parking, don't go too slow. I just, I'm like, oh, well, that wasn't, okay, okay. That wasn't my experience. I, I was driving on a, like, a street uh -huh. of a small city. And you city. were going too slow. It was an unmarked street, and I thought that those, like, in a neighborhood were automatically 25, but they're actually 35. Uh huh. So, yeah. I went too slow. Well, Anyways. that's rude. Yeah, how, dare dis you, I was how dare you? I pretty How dare you slow down all those drivers? And I remember you. telling the person who like was you know because all they do is furiously write the entire uh -huh. time. So you're like I'm done. again very nerve wracking. So I remember them at the end being like, "Nice job, you went too slow." And I was like, "Where?" They were like on whatever street that was, and I was like, "It was a residential street. There were like houses and millions of kids." I said unmarked or 35. I was like, "Oh, but I could have hit a I'll child." I'll take those points. Children are playing in this place. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. So the next time you're driving or commuting or road tripping and you can tell and identify a driver based on their behaviors and you know exactly what state they belong to. It's Maryland. Think back to this episode. It, it's Maryland. It Maybe. might be Maryland. It's Maryland. Okay. Anything right. else? No, I think that about wraps it up. It's kind of fun. That's something you don't ever think about it having a history of. Well, I've always wondered just like why certain drivers are so bad. And of course, there's a very individual element to all of this because you can go through a pretty strict driver's training program and still come out a terrible driver. But yeah. I do think that some attention might be paid to this at a national level because, again, this is not something that should vary state by state. <laughs> This is not the kind of thing, I, like, we, I know you were joking about Common Core, but, like, Common Core, a lot of people were pushing back on it because they were like, well, states want to have individualized instruction for stuff that's important to their regional whatever, blah, blah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, there really shouldn't be regional differences in driving. I mean, there might be no. regional differences in the sort of weather you have to deal with when driving, I would for example. That. 
like driving on really heavy snow is not a skill a lot of people are around here learn but luckily i've like had to drive on snow so i've learned some of that but that's that's really hard to like how do you train somebody to drive in if they're not in that very atmosphere. perilous yeah. weather conditions even in really heavy rain i mean ask a marylander it's but scary. uh that's something that i would i would love to see some something about when it comes to driver's training because driving in really rough weather is one of i mean those are the times when we've encountered our scariest driving moments it's either been in like fog or heavy heavy snow or heavy heavy rain. snow through the mountains that's been yeah. rough yeah and really bad rain too a couple of times like yeah. rains are bad way to pull over and sit yeah yeah but how do you plan? Yeah, how do you teach that? I don't know. I and mean, I mean, there might be an opportunity for like the VR to step into some. I was of this, kind of possibly. wondering that, but I also wanted to mention that you and I are speaking of a place of privilege because we had parents who cared to teach us and to give us the experiences to be good drivers. Like, I remember my dad being like, "Okay, it's raining. We're gonna go." You know, like, like we had we had people who cared to make sure that mm-hmm. we learned what we did too. For sure. So for sure. Some people are just just aren't going to have that. Well, you know? the, I mean, the other thing is, is it just takes like being a certain kind of level headed person who even wants to drive and that stuff in the first place to teach you. Yeah. Like my 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 dad has not ever been shy about driving in snow because he's just done a lot of it. Yeah. And watching him drive in snow is pretty much how I learned how to drive in snow. Yeah. I'm like, you just don't panic. You go mm-hmm. at a slower but mm-hmm. steady speed. You just got to keep moving. Keep a really good distance <laughs> between you and the yeah. car in front of you. So anyway, yeah, yeah. it's a. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, some but, of it I'm still learning, and I'm in my 30s. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I think there's going to maybe be some more attention paid to this over time because our, our traffic safety numbers are starting to slip. <laughs> and there m- might be a correlation to yeah, the slippage sure of the the consistency of driver's training uh-huh. programs in the country. For so. sure. It'd be interesting to me to see if it comes back into the public school public school zone, like if this becomes the domain of public I think that would again. be great. Yeah, a semester course that would be so great. I just think it maybe it shouldn't be one of those things that's treated as a privilege for the few. Maybe it's a basic skill that everybody yeah. should learn, regardless of whether or not you actually end up driving in your life. Perhaps you should yeah. know how to. That'd be cool. <laughs> so that'd be really cool. Anyway, there's just not enough time in the day for all of the things we need to learn. There's really not. Okay, are we ready to move on to our fill in the blank question? Yeah. All right, so fill in the blank, if you haven't been with us, because we've taken a few weird episodes where we haven't done it uh, recently, but fill in the blank is a little trivia section. We're going to give you our last question first, and then we'll ask you a new question. If you got the answer to the question, we would love to hear from you. Write into us, uh, email us, hello at 1621.com, all spelled out. We would love to hear from you if you answer correctly, or even if you don't answer correctly. Write in, say hello, we'll send you some stickers uh, for the show, and uh, we'd, we'd just love to to hear from you all so yeah. anyway i will do the last right. question that we had for it. Um, this was from our science and industry centers episode so that question was the first science center was established at, oh and by the way this is sort of like it, there's a lack of clarity on whether or not this was actually the first science center but this mm-hmm. is the first kind of recognized thing that was recognized as a science center it was established in 1951 in exposition park la and is called what that was the California Science Center. And then if you were to visit that science center, you could see the Mercury Redstone 2 capsule, uh, which carried Ham, a chimpanzee, the first great ape in space. That was in 1961. Gemini 11 capsule, Apollo Soyuz test project, command module from 1975 mission, and the space shuttle Endeavor. I would like to go to that yeah, place sometime. Sounds cool. I, I mean, I'd love to see space shuttles. They're, they're just... Yeah, I'd like to see Endeavor. You know, the thing about shuttles is that I always think they're smaller than they should be. Because you think of a space shuttle, you think of this just huge hulking beast of a oh. big, like big, big giant airplane yeah. is what my brain used to do when I was a kid. But they're actually pretty petite. They're more compact things. than I expected. See, yeah. was it Endeavor that was flown on the back of another airplane? Was that Endeavor that they took? I, I don't know if that was Discovery or Endeavor or one of the, I really but don't know. Seeing that totally blew my mind. Yeah. Because they were able to literally strap a shuttle on top of, I mean, it was a huge airplane. It's like a jumbo, jumbo. Yeah. Planner. And they flew it to its home. Mm-hmm. That's just wild. At somebody, I can't remember, this might have been a space camp thing, but they once described uh, space shuttles as like bricks with wings on them. Mm. They're really not meant to be flown in the traditional sense of airplanes because the physics of them, they are truly just like 
huge heavy chunks of stuff that happen to, to have and to get down slight little wings on the side little. for stabilization <laughs> not for lift so it's basically like a controlled brick descent when the shuttles come back into orbit and you just kind of hope everything is lined up uh and the physics of re-entry <laughs> i just like that description they have wheel, like a flying they brick land? yeah no they do they're just they're just um they're not maneuverable like air, oh, airplanes are okay, maneuverable okay. It's really just gravity doing the work, and and you just gotta put your brick fins, where it belongs. Yeah, you you gotta get your brick lined up. Anyway, <laughs> would you like to take the next question? I will. Okay. Okay. So this episode, the first state issued license plates were distributed in Massachusetts in 1903. The very first plate featuring just the number one was issued to blank. This person was working with the Highway Commission, and he was son of the famous Ice King. And to this day, one of his relatives still holds an active registration on the number one plate. Yeah, that's kind of a weird story. But so I was, like who was that? Who was that person who got the the number one on their license plate? That'd be a cool license plate. Yeah. Okay. What did you uh, What did you learn this week? I'm just going to give a warning, oh, if that's okay. A warning about what you learned. Well, I've done a lot of learning. It's dangerous knowledge. It is. Okay. Um, I have been watching Kanye over the past few weeks into October. And what I have learned is that he has a very large platform that is very scary. And I have learned that people are not always willing to question those that they should about things that they say without proper context and even sometimes just the facts. Mm -hmm. So I had a really good conversation with some of my students the other day about this. And we just kind of went through some of what he said and what he's done and what it implies. And you know what I mean? Kind of just working through it to figure out what he's doing. And we had an unfollowing party and we had a I'm deleting party, party. That's cute. Of which we all went through our phones and got rid of the songs and the accounts and things like that. And I had one of my students come in and tell me, you know, they he told me he, he's been a big Kanye fan since I've known him. He's mm -hmm. he's been a huge Kanye fan. He said, Well, you're the first one I'm gonna tell, but last night I had my last ever listen party to one of Kanye's albums. And then I deleted it because I know I just can't keep listening to it. And for an 18 year old boy in Southeastern Ohio, that felt like a big win. Yeah, that's pretty self aware. So yeah. uh, it's been, I will say, in the classroom, it's been really interesting as far as a conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot to be learned from watching his use of social media. I and remember you is... and I, yeah, you and I talked about Kanye because I was curious the extent to which Kanye still has a grip on the yeah, the young the youth, yeah, <laughs> the, the youth meaning not me. I, I was curious whether Kanye was still as popular. Yeah now as he was yep. you know when we were in, in college and high yeah. school and stuff and he he did seem to be from your from I your mean, descriptions there so. are not many people who have the uh, reach that he does yep so i've just been learning about how dangerous it is and also i've been learning how to chat with my students about something that is likely a result of a mental health concern mm -hmm. and issues that are not being treated properly but also knowing that Having mental health concerns is not an allowance for things otherwise. Yeah. And so it, it's just been, it's been, it's been really good conversations and, and I've appreciated those learning moments both ways. Yeah. So it's been good. I've heard some more nuanced conversations about mental health as a result of actually both Kanye and Elon acting yeah. like fools on Twitter. Yeah. I've heard some more nuance start to enter the conversation about mental health and digital spaces mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. I appreciate that. Of course, there's a lot of loud garbage like yeah. there usually is as well, but it's nice to see people start to ask difficult questions about platforms and audiences and sure. mental health and celebrity mm -hmm. and that grand cocktail and what that can do yeah. to the discourse. So, so. it's been not something I wanted to learn, mm -hmm. but stuff that I have learned. So the ADA has even put out um, a statement about Kanye. And so oh, wow. that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting to be learning. And I'm getting ready to when we come back from Christmas break, I start my Holocaust unit. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the conversation. This is, uh, you know, something we'll talk about because for it, those unaware, uh, Kanye, part of the problem of Kanye right now is that he's posting a bunch of very anti-Semitic imagery and other things. Anyway, mm -hmm. just in case you happen to not be tuned into that. But yeah. So it's kind of like, I, and I'm saying this 
and good humor because otherwise you can't do it. But, you know, I'm always looking for ways to make what I teach more accessible to my kids. And unfortunately, this is a way to make it accessible. But also, it's going to be a great learning moment. And it has been a great learning moment for, for my students to see kind of in real time this person just, you know. So it's been interesting. What did you learn? Oh, um, I'm reading a book, as I sometimes do, called Internet for the People. I forget the person's name who's writing it. I'm sure I'm going to be talking about this book for a little bit, though. It talks about a bunch of things, but one of the things it does at the beginning is kind of covers a history of the early Internet. And without going into a whole bunch of technical details, uh, the Internet sort of started out as a way for the military to talk to other members <laughs> yeah. of the military. Sure. Um, DARPA, you've probably heard of that. If you've seen those creepy robot dog things, the the yeah, the, the, they look like something out of Black Mirror. The Boston Robotics dogs. Yeah, yeah. The, I call them DARPA dogs because they're I don't I don't know exactly who owns the dogs oh, at this okay. point, but like similar research, yeah. like MIT. They're Boston, like the soldier dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boston Dynamics, MIT, DARPA, creepy military robots. So anyway, same same DARPA. Yeah. That DARPA, they had this network of nodes, let's just call them computers, that were the kind of early precursors of today's internet. This was a little bit before the internet as we know it now. They were all connected? They were a bunch of connected oh. bits of technology, and okay. it was called ARPANET. <laughs> so DARPA had this tech called ARPANET. They and could really use some rebranding to it, help all All of these acronyms, just <laughs> ridiculous. You can tell us a bunch of... DARPA. Like, well, the internet started out as a bunch of tech weenies, and, like, and I say this as a tech weenie myself, that's not a derogatory thing, but um, a I'm a tech weenie, weenie so... It started out as a bunch of researchers and tech weenies, and then obviously with the military applications, um, those were the people who used the early yeah. version of the internet. So anyway, this thing called ARPANET. DARPA was like, we can't, uh, people are starting to want to use this more. It needs more and more computing power behind it. We don't want to be the ones to maintain this network infrastructure. And also, we don't really have the uh, the legal authority to maintain this infrastructure so we need to privatize it we need to look for a privatization partner mm -hmm. from whom we can come up with a favorable deal we'll sell it to them mm -hmm. and they'll lease it back to us but they'll maintain it that's what Dar that's what darpa wanted to do okay so what i learned was that they approached at&t uh, among a couple of other vendors but they approached at&t and at&t was like no nah, not interested because they could not understand how to make money from it the internet. the internet. They couldn't make, figure out how to. How, okay. They couldn't figure out how they'd have a return on the on their investment in the internet. Oh, okay. So I just felt that that was very funny that AT and T had things could have gone very differently for the evolution of today's web if AT and T had been like, yes, yeah. I see that potential. But no, they're just like, yeah, no, not interested. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Imagine passing on that. <sighs> So anyway, privatization oh happened in various ways after that. But I just thought it was really funny that at t was like, yeah, nah, not, yeah. not so much. I will pass on that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I saw an interview recently where Matt Damon talked about how he passed on being in the original Avatar. Uh, mm -hmm. And James Cameron offered him like 5 or 10% of the movie to be in it. I and still don't actually, to be quite honest with you, understand b the hype of Ap Avatar. No, I but I it, tell you, but it was just mostly, I probably would have turned it down too. Is what I'm saying. I'm like, no, he was, blue people. That's weird. I don't get it. He said he was finishing like one of the Bourne, Jason Bourne films, uh -huh, uh -huh. and he'd already been like that committed to them, and they always had to do stuff in post, and so he knew he'd have to leave post to go do Avatar, and he felt like it wasn't right, mm -hmm. and so he didn't even really try to like make it work with the Bourne crew. And because just because he'd been in so many and he was talking about like, you want to talk about a bad business deal was like him now looking at what Avatar did. Turning down Avatar. And turning it down. And not like the Bourne supremacy. Like, you know, Jason Bourne has been a, a very successful franchise, but um, yeah, he, I just, it sounds just like what AT&T did, which was like, eh, we're not really too sure. Like for him, yeah, they he couldn't like, figure out how to make it work. So. <laughs> I don't see the potential in the internet. Sorry. Yeah. You know what? This probably will go nowhere. I think I laughed out loud when I read that. It was like, yeah, AT&T didn't really see the potential in this technology. And I was just like, oh, okay. That's, the irony is great. ARPANET. Yep. So the early kind of the oh. early network that became the internet when TCP IP came along. So what it could have been. Yes. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's about it. Maybe just like get into some good holiday 
stuff, whatever, whatever holiday it is you're into. Yeah. Take care of yourself. It's going to, it's always stressful for teachers this time of year, just be, managing the classroom dynamic between now and Christmas break or the holiday break or whatever mm -hmm. is always mm -hmm. a challenge. Yep. So just make sure you have more than enough ready to go. Cause if they're anything like my students, they can't have a moment of free time or they explode <laughs> like banshees, which is what my day was like today. Take care of yourself. Spike your eggnog. And yeah. uh, we'll see you in two weeks. We'll see you. Bye. Bye. Hey, listeners. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. I am the Ice King. I'm Mr. Ice. Remix.